Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, another presentation from Wide Closet Presentations and Mobile Video. Today we shall talk about Hans Christian Erster, the guy whom you know to have been the inventor of the uh, electromagnetism in the 1820s. But he was also a lot of other things. He was into philosophy, he was into medicine, he was into pharmacy, he was a physicist, a chemist, he was a lot of things. He was a multi-scientist, which was rather important and rather ordinary for his day, but he actually expelled in most of these categories. He was a very vibrant guy, and he was in a vibrant period in Danish history. And, something you might, may not know if you're not a native speaker of Danish, <laughs> he introduced 2,000 new words into the Danish vocabulary, including the Danish words for butterfly, parachute, density, and there are lots of them, which is quite remarkable, I th I'd say. He did that because he wanted to, let's say, nationalize scientific vocabulary. Most of these things existed as phrases either imported from abroad or in Latin which, of course, excluded many other people from getting to know them. So he wanted science to be something for the people. Have we heard that before? I'll get back to that one. And he was in exceedingly interested in the new sciences of any kind. As I mentioned, we all know him as the inventor of electromagnetism. He did that in 1820 with a series of papers and a book. However, he did himself find out that he was not the first one. He had discovered that it had already been discovered in 1802 by the Italian philosopher and scientist Gianni Domenico Romagnosi, who lived somewhere around the 1760s and he died in 1835. He was from Milan. That didn't bother him at all, at all. As he stated quite previously after that, he may have discovered it, but I have refined it. I made it publicly available to anybody. And he was right in that respect. It was only after Erster that people like Faraday in Britain and others came to the conclusion that there's something here we need to look into. But he was not the only Erster. There, there was another Erster. Um, this can actually, this is a bit of an ambiguous statement. It can be understood in two ways. Hans Christian Erster had a, bl a brother. He was called A.S. Erster. Anders, to be more specific. And he went on to be Denmark's third Prime Minister after the introdu introduction of the 1848 Constitution. He was a very, very influential man in politics, and he is regarded as one of the main characters in the Danish Golden Age. The Golden Age was we see in Denmark as being somewhere between the 18 late 20s and until, quite precisely, 1864, where it's all chopped to bits by the Prussian army and we lost in a big battle for Let's, so, let's call it national identity. <clears throat> the other Erstel still can also be perceived as something else, because there is also another Erstel to Hans Christian Erstel. And that is interesting, because what he did, he did something entirely different, which is not known at all, at, at least not very commonly known. He introduced the demand for a new science, a new scientific method. He was a firm believer of verification. You can't just go about and stipulate data without verifying them. And if you're a very clever scientist, you start by verifying and then you introduce them to the market. He constantly emphasized the great, with great determination that we should always begin to observe. Let's start by looking around. And then, if at all possible, then we should, we should verify the following results. In the same way, before it can be determined as fact. And why did he say that? Because many of his scientist colleagues of its day were under the influence of the romantic period, romanticism. That meant that they first stipulated things, then sought them verified. And as you all know, if you stipulate, I believe the Earth is flat. When I look into the horizon, I can see nothing, then it's probably flat. So that's the kind of science he was up against. And that, of course, also was the kind of science that Louis V. Holberg was protesting against in the 1760s. This other Erster was also a big believer of uh, and a big fan of Immanuel Kant. 
He believed in the essence of discretion, and several of Erster's major and minor decisions acted. Uh, he agreed with Kent, with Kent in most of it. And the basic thing about this is that man himself is a part of nature. At its day, man himself was regarded a product of God. It was a divine influence that put us here. We were above nature. We had nothing to do with nature. Nature was a product of God, but on the seventh day, he, et cetera, et cetera. Man came along eventually as a result of a direct link to God. We were made in God's image. So naturally, since God is not a tree, uh, we must be above all the rest of the shit. And that was a big of a problem, a bit of a problem, since science already then began to stipulate, hmm, there's something rotten here. So, we are also, as a consequence of that, a subject to nature's laws. We have to correct ourselves and adjust ourselves to nature's laws. We can't jump in the, jump in the air forever, for instance. We are basically under the scrutiny of the law of gravity. We can't change that. Uh, but the thing that differs us from the rest, as far as we can tell by now, that is, is that we are conscious of this. We know of it. We know that we are. We don't believe that we are, and therefore we are. We know these laws apply, and we know how to deal with it, and therefore we can, we can relate to them. And that is the thing, actually. And that is what brought him into a huge fight with Mr. Denmark himself, good old Nikolai Felix Sivin Grundtvig, that you may recall from our previous lectures. Because Grundtvig had a quite different notion of all this. In Grundtvig's mind, there's always a bit of divinity behind everything. It's always, ding, the big guy on the first floor who makes all the decisions for us, and therefore his presence can be felt in everything. And Erster just couldn't have that. He couldn't accept that as being scientific in any shape or form. So he had a big row with Grontwy. He had an increasingly bigger row with Ingemann and Oehlenschläger, two very influential and important guys from the Danish Golden Age in the 1820s. These big disputes took place somewhere between 1808 and 1830. And they were all about something crucial to Erster, science. He accused Grontwy in particular for being non-scientific and to try to impose religion and romanticism upon science. And he was probably right. He was way ahead of his time. He was ahead of Ranke from Germany, who introduced the new basis of science in the 1830s and the Humboldt University of Berlin. He was way before Erslev, who refined these and introduced new scientific methods, especially in history and philosophy, at the University of Copenhagen in the 1870s. This is the 1820s. He had an incredible foresight as compared to many of his relatives. And that is, again, what makes him interesting to me, because he does that here. Why here? Why in Denmark? And where does all this come from? How, um, what is it that initiates this uh, curiosity, this curiosity of science, this curiosity of is that right? Uh, we seem to question many things that seem to be law elsewhere. And with we, I mean Denmark as what is, has turned out to be yet another Lilliput state. Uh, we had our big fight with the rest of Europe in 1814, and, and here comes the sentence the Norwegians hate. They took away Norway from us. But that is not entirely true, because Norway gained their independence somewhat, at least. They were given to Sweden, the poor sods. <laughs> Sorry, Sweden. And uh, <laughs> it took them another almost 100 years to gain independence. But we did not see it like that in 1814. I can assure you of that. And especially Grundtvig was very, very heavily under influence of, this, of these facts. He, he lived in an, in an age of yes. And he saw an age of huh, damn. And we were transformed under his, in his age and day, we were transformed from a relatively big power in Europe, Denmark, Norway, including Holstein and Schleswig, and a few other things, a few other dominions, we were reduced to, to almost nothing, to small Denmark centered around, and then came the war in 1848. Ah, we won. 
unfortunately really didn't win as such, but the Russians kindly and politely asked the Germans to get, off, get out of there. In 1864, we had our asses kicked big time and were reduced to something that might have been annihilated. So all in one life. That is what actually had an incredibly big impact on, on Nikolai Friedrich's every country. It didn't have any impact on Erster, interestingly enough. He couldn't care less. He was into science. His brother, though, saw it slightly differently, but still, science was the prevailing argument here. And that's why they couldn't, they just couldn't have it. He couldn't have Gondry, and Gondry definitely couldn't have him. <laughs> okay, so what was actually his idea about everything? Erster said, let us modernize science. Let's do something about all this. Let's get rid of all the old crap, introduce the new stuff, and let's be scientific about it. Referring to what he meant about science. Let us structuralize science. Let's organize science in ways and manners that enable us, enables us to reproduce whatever we have discovered previously, to enable us to report to others what we have discovered in the same way as we previously did. So that is actually what he was all about. He wanted to, he wanted to standardize, standardize things. He wanted things to be new and better. So therefore, to sum it all up, Erstes believed in the following as regards to science. Let's modernize it. Let's modernize science. Let's get rid of all the old dogma. Let's do things in a standardized way that everybody can find out. And therefore, let's structuralize. Let's stick to knowledge, findings. Let's forget about assumptions. Let's forget about faith. Let's forget about things that cannot, definitely cannot be verified. And let's organize our findings in ways that allows others to look at it and say, aha, and make their own findings and add to our knowledge. And above all, let's be curious. Let's ask questions. So if anybody says, you were made by God, you should ask, how, when? Can you verify that? Ah, your mother was probably Turkish because your skull is short. Is that so? How does it work? Are you sure about that? Can you verify it? So ask the curious questions all time. Still applies today, doesn't it? That is really the core business behind all that has to do with science. We have to be curious. We have to ask questions on an everyday basis. Otherwise, why are we here as scientists? And above all, let us document all these findings. Well, it goes a bit back to the structuralization and the modernization. But we need to document what we find. And there's a point that I left out. Let's tell people about it. Let's communicate to the world what did we find. Let's allow people to bid in on things. I don't believe you. The, round, the Earth is not round. It's square, you bastards. <laughs> what do we know? So we have to verify that it's round. We have to stand behind our knowledge and verify it. It's not enough to say, because I say so. Or with a cunning use of flags. I'm sorry, Eddie, is he? Is that? <laughs> we have to verify things. We have to be serious about it. When we do that, it's a smacker. And this, ladies and gentlemen, will end today's presentation on Hans Christian Erster. There will be others. He's a very exciting guy. He lived in an exciting time. And he was quite extraordinary. And I like the links between him and our good guy, Gondry, and the other guys, especially in Denmark for some strange reason. That's what I'm trying to figure out what that's all about. And we're in the 1820s, somewhere around that. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Today's presentation has, as always, been fantastically edited by mobile video, Paul Grundke and his team. <laughs> Thank you.